you're entering a realm of imagination where your dreams are told between the lines of the universe. This is a Midnight Tale podcast. I'm your host, Celeste, your guide through this dreamscape. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm so glad that you are all here again today for a new story. For November, like I said last time, I'm trying to focus more on true crime. So for this week's tale, it's going to be about a kidnapping or disappearance. As for December, I'm going to be shifting my focus away from true crime because for Christmas time, I really would like to focus more on heartwarming and traditional stories. So get ready for some more heartfelt, warm stories for December. I definitely have to admit, I have a guilty pleasure of watching very cheesy and sappy stories, but I'll try to make mine much more heartfelt and heartwarming. But back to this week's story. This week's tale is about how my best friend Natalie goes missing. There are many clues that lead me to be suspicious that something bad has happened, but nobody seems to believe me. Since I can't trust anyone to help, I take matters into my own hands and discover what is really going on. Keep listening to find out what happens to Natalie Morales. I was sitting at my kitchen table with a massive pile of paperwork around me for my final exam studies. The tabletop was covered with numerous study guides, textbooks, and my laptop was open. It was filled with tabs as I searched and wrote down answers for questions that I knew could possibly be on the final exam. I took a second to stretch as I looked out the window. I could see that the sun was going down. I sighed and looked at my phone. I realized that it had already been six hours since I had started studying. Thankfully, my marine biology exam wasn't until the next week. I had actually planned ahead and not procrastinated in studying. I was going to give myself a little break over the weekend, especially since tomorrow was Friday. I was planning on seeing my friends to have a little mental break and not completely fry my brain. Thankfully, my family had been very quiet as they were all in their rooms tucked away, either playing games like my brother or my parents were just watching TV, probably fast asleep after a day of work. I got up and started clearing off some of the paperwork so that they could have some dinner. I decided I would finish up studying in my room. As I was cleaning up, my phone rang. I saw that it was from my best friend, Natalie. I immediately picked it up. We had gone through everything together in college and we had grown very close over the years. I picked up the phone and said, hey, what's up? I heard Natalie's cheerful voice resonate from the other end of the phone. She said, hey girl, I hope you're done studying for the night because you told me, like, I don't know when, that you started studying, so you better not be right now. I looked over at the pile of paperwork and said, no, I finished a while ago. I could almost feel her eyes roll, and she said, you're such a liar. You probably just stopped right now because I called you. I said, I finished right before you called me, so there's a difference. We both laughed a little. Natalie said, good, because you told me you were going to plan a date for that guy that you met online. I said, yes, I know. We actually already planned a date for this Saturday, so you can hear all about it afterwards. Natalie laughed and said, good, because I want to hear all of the gory details when you are done. Also, you know, I've been a bit pushy about it because I know you can be reserved. I just want you to have something nice, you know. I know you've been looking forward to a new relationship, so I'm happy for you putting yourself out there. I said, I know, and you have been really encouraging these past couple weeks, and I really appreciate it. Natalie said, of course, girl, you know I've always got your back. And if you need me to, I can always interrogate him afterwards. I laughed and said, I don't think so. I don't think most people can handle your killing with kindness interrogation. That's a surefire way to make sure I'll be alone forever. Natalie said, How else am I going to perfect my interrogation skills? I want to impress when I make it to the academy. I said, I think you got it covered. Natalie said, Oh, that reminds me. I'm actually going to have me and Lewis's DNA test finally updated in the website at like 11 p.m. tonight. I said, Oh, that's cool. Let me know what you find out. 
Natalie said, yeah, I'm actually going to surprise my mom first because, you know, I didn't tell her about it. You know, we're from such a small family, so it would be kind of cool to learn a little bit more about our family history and where we come from. You know, since she doesn't really have a lot of that information. Although, I might call Louis first because he's such a big nerd about it. So I know that he'll be really into that. Also, the main reason is because, you know, he wants to know more about his family tree. Since he was adopted and his parents died, you know, he really wants that kind of closure. I said, well, I hope you guys find out a lot of different things. And who knows, maybe you'll find a great aunt who's filthy rich and left you a little something. Both of us laughed and we talked a little bit more about ancestry and our genealogy and what could possibly be on it. Then Natalie said, before I forget the reason why I called, can I ask you to do me a huge favor? Natalie asked, I'm planning on going over to my mom's this weekend. I'm going to go this Friday morning. Can you help me load a couple things? I'm planning to take back some small cabinets. I found some better ones that fit in with the whole aesthetic kind of thing I'm going for. So can you come tomorrow morning since Louis isn't going to come home until Friday afternoon? I remember that Natalie's boyfriend Louis was off on a work trip. They had been living together for a few months now, and although things have been a bit rocky lately, they still made a good couple. I said, sure, what time do you need me to be there? Natalie said, not too early, like 7.30 a.m.? I sighed and said, that's supposed to be early. You know I don't have any class tomorrow. She said, I know, but for me... I sighed again and said, yeah, I guess. She said, thank you so much. I'll make sure to buy you something to eat the next time we hang out. We talked for a few more minutes, just talking about various other things like school and work. I finally hung up and cleared out the rest of the table and made myself some dinner. My brother and my parents came downstairs as soon as they heard me rattling around in the kitchen. We talked about our day and our plans for the weekend. Both me and my brother had scheduled our college classes to end on Thursday, so we were both free on Fridays. The both of us helped each other cook dinner for everyone. We were all feeling kind of lazy, so we made a quick spaghetti with a sausage and beef sauce along with a side salad. When dinner was done, our parents thanked us. But they sat on the couch, especially my dad, who kicked up his feet and lounged in his favorite spot on the couch. Me and my brother sat at the kitchen table and talked a little bit. I asked him if he would come with me tomorrow to help. He asked what time it was, and when I told him it was at 7.30 in the morning, he just gave me a look and said, no. I tried to make my case, but I knew it was a lost cause because he definitely was not going to get up that early. When I was done eating, I told my parents goodnight and that I was going to head up to do some final studying and then right to sleep, so that way they wouldn't really bother me. I studied for a few more hours before I finally went to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I felt very relaxed and rested. I quickly got dressed and headed out the door. Natalie's apartment wasn't too far from my house, about 20 minutes away. She lived in a very small community apartment building where there was only about four units, so they were on the larger side and they have more parking around them than a normal apartment did. This allowed for each of them to have guest parking as well. As I pulled into the back lot behind the apartment building, I noticed that her car wasn't parked in her spot. I thought that was really weird and thought maybe she had gone out for some coffee and breakfast, as she didn't really like cooking. But usually she would have told me where she was going, even just to ask me if I wanted something to eat and to just let myself in. I went around to the front of the apartment building and climbed up the stairs to her unit. I let myself into the apartment with my key. I had a key because I was there a lot. I also came over sometimes to check on her dogs when she and Louis would go out somewhere overnight. As I entered into the apartment, I realized that her dogs were out of their crates. She usually kept them in there for the night so that they wouldn't get into any trouble and also so they could be quiet during the night. They both came up to me whining like crazy. I quickly closed the door behind me. I went into the kitchen and noticed that their water and food bowls were empty. I thought this was weird because I knew as soon as Natalie let her dogs out of the crate in the morning, she would feed them and give them water. She always felt kind of bad having them in the crate all night because they couldn't get up to get a glass of water like she wanted to. That's why she always made sure to take care of them right away in the morning. I decided to feed and water her dogs while I called her. 
I pulled out my phone and called her number. I quickly filled up the water bowls and set them down on the floor, which the dogs happily licked up. As I filled up their food bowls, the phone rang and rang on her end and she didn't pick up. I thought that was weird because she almost always picked up on the first ring. I placed the food bowls down onto the floor, which the dogs happily ate. I called her phone again and it just continued to ring endlessly. I walked around her living room. I saw that her keys were gone along with her laptop that she usually kept on her coffee table in front of her couch. Besides the front door, I saw the two medium glass door cabinets along with some large bags full of clothes sitting right next to it. The cabinets had some wrapping around them to protect them when we put them in the car. The long skinny cabinets also had extra bubble wrap sitting on top of them, ready to be rolled around them. I took a quick peek into her room and saw that it was a bit messy. Usually she kept her room very pristine, but I saw that some of her perfume bottles were knocked over on her dresser and her bed wasn't made. She was one of the only people that I knew who made her bed when she woke up in the morning. I looked a little closer at her dresser and realized that all of the pictures on it had been taken off. I looked around the room and noticed that her trash can wasn't in its usual spot, but it was by the other side of her bed. The pictures that had been on top of the dresser were all thrown into the trash. I saw that the pictures were all of just her and her boyfriend, some special memories that they had had and trips that they had taken. Some of the glass on the frames had even broken because she had thrown them in there with such force. I was worried that they had gone into a fight over the phone and I was wondering what it could have been that would have just caused her to leave so suddenly. I thought maybe she had gone to her mom's really late to get comfort for whatever fight that she and Lewis had had. I thought back to their relationship and what problem could have possibly have blown up so big. I really like Lewis and Natalie together. They've had many fun times together. They understood each other's quirks quite well. I thought they communicated pretty well with each other and overall seemed to be really into each other. The only thing that I could think of was that lately Natalie was worried about Lewis's extra work trips. I think the problem had been happening over the past couple of months where Lewis would take extra work trips that seemed to be more spontaneous and less planned than the others. She was worried that maybe this was a sign of something more and that he wasn't on a work trip, but it was something more nefarious. Natalie had been cheated on before in a previous relationship, so she was always a little paranoid about things like that. I knew that they had been working together on communication and regaining her trust because he always had proof about where he was with his whole itinerary with tickets and everything because he understood that she needed some healing from that horrible relationship. I had also told her that she shouldn't see the same flaws in him because he was a different man than her previous boyfriend. I was worried that maybe that I was wrong and that I had been giving her some wrong advice. I really hoped that I wasn't though, just for her sake. As I left her room, I went down and sat on the couch. I scrolled through my phone hoping to see if I had her mom's number saved in it. I think I had used it once a long time ago when Natalie's phone was broken and she was still living with her mom. Me and Natalie had initially bonded at college because of the fact that we were both commuters to the school and that she lived further away than most, or at least further than I did. The trip usually took her about 45 minutes and if she was speeding, 30. I found the phone number in my call list and quickly called Natalie's mom, Mrs. Morales. Mrs. Morales picked up the phone and asked, Hello? I said, Hi, Mrs. Morales. It's me, Celeste. I know it's been ages since I called you, but have you seen Natalie? Mrs. Morales said, Oh, hello, Celeste. It's so nice to hear from you again. I didn't think you were going to be at Natalie's place. I said, Well, she needed some help to return some cabinets that you let her borrow. So that's why I was here in the morning to come help her before she went over to your house today. Mrs. Morales said, Oh, I see. She paused for a second and then said, Is there anything else that she had for me over there or for you? I said, No, there's nothing here to say where she went and that's why I have no clue where she is. That's why I'm calling you. She said, Well, Natalie was here last night. She was quite upset and tearful. She told me that she had proof that Lewis was cheating on her. But from what she told me, it wasn't anything abnormal. It just seemed like work-related trips that he was taking 
and just some other normal activity. I know that she was deeply affected by her previous relationship, but we both know that she doesn't really think coherently about these sort of things. I said, I know, but I think she just needs time. So is she still there? Mrs. Morales sighed and said, she got quite upset with me. You know how much of a hot temper she can have. And when I wouldn't agree with her, she just stormed off. I can't remember when she left. It was so early in the morning. When she was here, I tried to make her stay. I tried to reason with her. Nothing could get through to her. She wouldn't see my side of things. She wouldn't understand what I was telling her and wouldn't let it go. So she left. I assumed that she had been driving back to her place, but I guess she didn't. Maybe she got tired and pulled off somewhere to sleep. Have you tried her cell? I said I have, but it just keeps ringing and ringing and she won't pick up. Mrs. Morales said, I'm sure she has it on silent or something, you know. She doesn't want to be disturbed. Probably doesn't want me to call her and try to reason with her again. When she sets her mind to something, she doesn't change. I said, you're probably right. I'll wait to see when she turns up. I'll give you a call back when she comes back. Mrs. Morales said, okay, keep me updated and let me know. I hung up the phone. I called Natalie's phone one more time and the same thing happened. It just rang and rang and she didn't pick up. I went outside to see if maybe there was some mail or something out there that could give me a clue about where she had gone. Although to be honest, it was a big stretch at this point because I was really thinking of things to do while I waited for her. I went outside to her mailbox. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw what looked like Lewis's car driving by. I quickly turned around and moved closer to the street to see if it was really his. However, it zoomed past. I shook my head. I realized that it couldn't be his car because he wasn't supposed to come until the afternoon. Also, he had a very common car. I was probably just confusing it with his. I went back to checking the mail. I didn't see anything besides the usual bills and junk mail. I went back up to the apartment with the mail and I decided to clean up a little bit around the apartment. I put a bag around the trash can so that way none of the glass could fall out through the metal holes. I put it off to the side to deal with it when she came back. I made up her bed and put her perfume back in place. Her dog silently followed me around the apartment. Smush was a medium sized white terrier mix and Butters was a pretty big for her size, mostly French bulldog mix. They looked at me and I wish I could have asked them what the heck was going on with Natalie last night and why she hasn't come back home yet. I really didn't want to wait around inside, so I decided to take the dogs on a walk. As I looked for their leashes, I noticed that her printer, which was in her living room, had some paper that slid under the TV stand. I grabbed them and I noticed that they were from the genealogy site that she had told me about last night. I knew that she always liked to print out stuff so that it was easier for her to read and focus on than when it was written on her laptop. I scanned over the papers in my hand. It didn't really have much information, just some relatives and the end statements were some legal disclaimers. I put the paperwork into my bag so that way I could give it to her when she came back. Also to remind myself to buy her a tray or something so that way her papers wouldn't fall off her printer. I found the leashes, I locked up and then Smush and Butters were leading the way. I decided to take a long walk with them to get some fresh air and just to see around the neighborhood. As we walked back to the house, I noticed that a familiar car was parked across the street. I walked over to it and realized that there was a bumper sticker of a kangaroo on the back bumper. I immediately knew that it was Lewis's car. I walked up to it and looked inside. I saw that there was some luggage and clothes strewn around in the back of the car. I noticed a little light pop up on the floor by the passenger side. I moved over to the other side of the car. I saw that it was a phone on the floor. I could only assume that it was Lewis's. I noticed that the screen was majorly cracked and the cracking made it hard to make out who was calling. I tried to get a better angle by crouching down, but the damage was too severe for me to read through the cracks. I heard footsteps running towards the car. I yanked my head around and saw that it was Lewis. I quickly moved around to the front of the car where he could see me. I knew that it had been his car earlier. I wanted to know if he had any answers to what was going on with Natalie. As soon as Lewis saw me, he froze in the middle of the street. 
I called out to him and asked, Louis, do you know what happened to Natalie? She wasn't here when I showed up in the morning. Louis stared at me for what seemed like forever. His brown eyes were wide with concern and fright. I noticed in his arms what seemed like documents and file folders. He flicked his brown hair out of his face, but it fell right back into his face, which he tilted his head down to hide behind. He asked, have you spoken to Mrs. Morales yet? I looked at him slightly confused by his answer and what he was doing back so early. I said, yes, I talked to her earlier, but she didn't really have a clue where Natalie went after she left her mom's house. But she did say that Natalie thought that you were cheating on her. He looked down at the ground and said, right, yeah, that. I looked at him hard with a glare and said, yeah, that. So it's true, isn't it? Lewis kept his head down and stared at the floor. He didn't move or respond. I yelled at him, is it true or not? He flinched back, but I saw he nodded his head in a yes once. It was a small movement, but I knew I saw it. He immediately started shaking his head and covered his mouth with his hand. I was super confused and asked in a harsh voice, was that a yes or no? What is wrong with you? Why are you here so early? And did you see Natalie today? Lewis continued to shake his head and was very pale. He started running towards the car and exclaimed, I can't deal with this right now. I stepped in front of the driver door, blocking his path. Smush and Butters both started pulling on the leashes, trying to get close to Lewis. Lewis kept running without stopping. He shoved me hard out of the way. I fell down onto one of my knees to avoid stepping on the dogs. I yelled out, hey, what is your problem? What are you trying to hide? I picked myself up and rushed over to the driver's side door. Lewis had gotten inside his car and I could hear the doors click shut and lock. He was also turning over the engine, turning on the car. I smacked on the window and yelled, where is Natalie? Lewis looked at me with big scared eyes, but there was something else in them that I couldn't quite tell what that feeling was. Then suddenly his car lurched forward and he started speeding down the street. The dogs both jumped out of the way as their paws had almost gotten run over. I stared in shock as I watched the taillights of Lewis's car disappear around the corner. I stood there just shaken by what I had just experienced. I was trying to make sense of it all. I turned around slowly and started to walk back to the apartment. I had no idea what to think. I didn't know what my next move should be or who to talk to. I was just trying to process all the weirdness that had just happened. As I walked into the apartment, I let the dogs off from their leashes. They ran to their usual spots on their dog beds by the couch. I sat down on the couch as well, and I noticed that it was messier than I had left it, which made sense because Lewis had gotten in, and he had probably rifled through the cabinets and different drawers to find whatever files he had taken with him. I thought for a second and then decided to call back Mrs. Morales to see if maybe she had gotten into contact with Lewis. Maybe that's why she was his first response when I had asked too many questions. I pulled out my phone and stared at it for a second before a realization washed over me. I could probably track or at least get close enough to Natalie's location with one of my social media apps that I had downloaded. One of the features that was part of it was that I showed the location of my friends who granted access to me. I knew that Natalie had downloaded this app as we had used it multiple times in the past. I knew that she had given me access to see her location because she had lost her phone multiple times before and that's how we had found it. It was also an easy way for us to find each other by looking at the map if we were ever lost in a crowd. I quickly opened the app in my phone, then looked over at the map section and sure enough, I saw her location had been updated. I saw that her icon wasn't at her apartment, but in some forest, halfway between her mom's house and her apartment. I noticed that the icon had been updated a few hours ago, and I hoped that she was still there, that she was still sleeping off her tiredness and her anger. I put the dogs away in their crates, and then I gathered up my things. 
I rushed over to my car and jumped in. I marked the spot on my GPS and I started driving right over. The location wasn't too far, probably about 20 minutes away. I just started driving. The closer I got, I soon recognized the area that Natalie's icon was in because I had driven past it many times before going over to Mrs. Morales' house. But more importantly, we had actually gone into that forest quite a few times together before and after Natalie's dad had died from his cancer. We had taken several trips there as he loved to hike and enjoyed the nature views. It was one of the few federally protected forest parks in the area and it had a special surprise at the end of one of the hiking trails, which was a waterfall and a huge outcropping that looked over the edge of it. The outcropping gave a huge, beautiful view down the valley and right in front of the waterfall. Also, if you went down the right trails, you could go down past the homes and industrial areas to the rest of the forest, which was huge. Although that took quite a few hours to reach and none of us had ever made the trek. The location made some sense for Natalie to go out there to take a rest. It made sense because it was halfway between her apartment and her mom's house. Although I don't know why she couldn't have just driven 20 minutes more to get to her apartment. Maybe she was so upset she needed to pull over to handle her emotions, but I think she would want to do that at home and not in the middle of a parking lot at three in the morning in the dark. The only other thing that I could think of was that maybe she wanted to stay out there close to her father as it was one of his favorite spots to go to. If she was that upset, she probably wanted to feel some comfort. Although I don't know why she didn't just call me because I would have gone over or would have picked her up. Whatever she needed, she knew that. As I got closer to the location, I called Mrs. Morales to let her know and ask her a couple of questions. Mrs. Morales picked up after a few rings. I said, Hi, Mrs. Morales. I just wanted to let you know I think I know where Natalie is because I was able to see her phone is at Belden Park. Mrs. Morales asked, How did you find her location so quickly? I said, I have an app on my phone which has a map on it where you can find your friends on it from wherever they are in the world. We have used it a few times before, so that's how I knew I could see her phone. I think I'm one of the few people who have her location on this app anyway, so I was really happy when I realized it. Mrs. Morales paused for a second and said, That's good. Are you heading out there right now? I think I hear you're in your car. I said, Yes, I'm in my car and I'm heading over right now. Mrs. Morales said, See, I told you I knew that she would have just pulled over to rest. She was very upset too. She probably was very tired. Okay, please let me know when you get there. I have to go, I have a call waiting. I said, Mrs. Morales, before you go, I talked to Louis before I left Natalie's apartment and I wanted to know if you had talked to him. Mrs. Morales said, yes, I was trying to get in contact with him again. I asked again. Mrs. Morales said, Yes, because I had called him when Natalie had shown up at the house to confront him about what she had been saying, but he said it wasn't true. Although, she trailed off, then asked, How was he like when you talked to him? What did he seem like? I said he was really upset. He seemed scared. He wouldn't answer any of my questions either, so I don't know what's going on with him. Also, the fact that he came here so early, I thought he was going to fly in and then come in the afternoon. Mrs. Morales said, well, I did call him very early in the morning to talk to him about what was happening. He said he was going to drive right down to talk to Natalie. Perhaps he met with Natalie before he talked to you. I thought for a second and said, I don't know. He didn't seem like he was very sure what was going on kind of seemed like he was lost, although who knows. It was all probably true when Natalie was saying, I knew I should have believed her. Mrs. Morales said, It seems to be turning out that way. If you're able to get in contact with him again, please tell him I'm trying to get in touch with him and tell him the other things that you have told me. Please call me back as soon as you get to Belden Park. I said, Okay, I will, Mrs. Morales. 
I hung up the phone as I was already pulling up to the parking lot for Belden Park. As I pulled into the lot, I saw immediately Natalie's car off to the far side, closest to the start of the trail. I quickly parked right next to it, and I looked inside through the driver's window, and I didn't see anybody. Disappointment rushed through my body. I got out of my car to inspect the car further. I looked inside and didn't see much. The car was spotless. There were no papers, laptop, keys, or a phone I could see. An odd thing that I noticed was that the seat was set back way further than it should be. Natalie was short and liked to sit as forward as she could as possible when driving. I called her phone to see if maybe it was hidden in a corner of her car. As I called in the distance, I heard a faint ringing. It was barely audible, but I could still hear it through the trees. I panicked and the worst thoughts ran through my mind as no one picked up. I dialed 911. I didn't know what I was gonna find and I didn't wanna wait any longer for help if I needed it. When the operator picked up, I said, I need the police and rescue. My friend is missing in Belden Park. My friend's name is Nicole Morales and she's been missing since last night. I'm not sure what time she arrived in Belden Park, but it was dark and early in the morning. I know something is wrong. She won't pick up the phone and her car is here and I'm just, I'm so afraid that she's hurt. The operator told me to slow down and stay calm. He asked, what is your name? I said, my name is Celeste de Luna. I started jogging down the trail towards where I heard the phone ringing. I hoped that my phone connection would last as I walked down the path. The operator asked, you said that Nicole is missing. How do you know she is in Belden Park? I said, because her car is in the parking lot. I can hear her phone now and she has to be here. I could hear the line crackling on the other end and the sound was getting fuzzy. The operator asked, how long has Natalie been missing? I said, I don't know, a few hours? The operator asked, is it possible that Natalie just wanted to go on a hike and that she's there voluntarily? I yelled, who goes on a hike at three in the morning? The operator said, ma'am, I'm just considering all the possibilities. I'll send out police and fire just in case your friend may be hurt on the trail. I rolled my eyes and put the phone down by my side because at this point it was crackling and breaking up so much that I could hardly hear what the guy was saying anyway. I continued down the path that I had been jogging down the whole time. I had been carefully looking and scanning the area for any hint of Natalie. I put the operator on hold and I called Natalie's phone again. I heard it much closer now. It sounded like it was still on the trail but a little bit off into the forest. I called her phone again and sprinted to where I heard it. My heartbeat was louder with each step as I took as I got closer to the ringing phone. My mouth became dry and my breathing became more ragged as I could feel my body tense with anxiousness about what could be right around the bend in the trail. The phone rang one final time before I stopped. It was loud and clear now. I slowed down to a fast walk and walked past the tree around the corner. Lying in the dirt, by a small creek, was the phone, with blood sprinkled around it. As I got closer to the phone, I could see that the ground was torn up like if there was a fight, with deep gashes in the dirt. I looked down at the phone and it was completely shattered. There was blood smeared on the screen, leaking into the cracks. I followed the blood trail. It led off to the side of the trail into the bushes. I could see that there were several broken branches and drag marks. I parted the bushes a little and walked past them, and I came to a muddy patch where there was clear drag marks and trampled brush. There was also a smudged footprint. I saw next to it was a paw print. It was large, and I couldn't tell if it was a mountain lion or a bear. Either way, it was unmistakable that it was there. I put the operator back on. I brought the phone up to my ear and said, you have to bring everyone. Natalie is definitely in trouble. As I talked to the operator, I could feel eyes watching me. My skin began to crawl and I shivered in the shade of the trees. I listened to see if there was anything walking along, but I heard nothing but birds singing. 
the creaking of branches and the gentle flow of water. I wonder if that creature was still there, waiting to find another victim. I wanted to pick up Natalie's phone, but the operator told me not to touch anything, and I made my way back to the parking lot. I kept scanning the whole area while I was walking back, scared that something would jump out of the bushes and grab me just like it did Natalie. After a while, I finally made it back to the parking lot, and a cop was already waiting for me. I hung up on the operator. The police officer got out of his car and introduced himself as Detective Paver. I was a little surprised that he was there so quick. I wondered how far behind the other officers and the fire crew were. Detective Paver pulled me to the side and asked me what was going on. I told him everything. I told him about the conversation last night with Natalie, where we were supposed to meet up this morning. I told him about the weird broken pictures, her dogs being out, and how there was a lot of things that I thought were suspicious in her apartment. The fact that she hadn't told me anything and that she wasn't there at the apartment when she was always punctual and not one for straying off a plan. I also told him about her suspicious boyfriend and how we all thought he was cheating on her. That probably linked to the broken pictures. Natalie's mom had also confirmed that she had gone over and talked to Mrs. Morales about the cheating and had evidence. Also, her boyfriend Louis had been acting very strange. Louis didn't answer any of my questions about where she was. All of those events had led me right here to this point in Belden Park because it was halfway between Mrs. Morales' house and Natalie's house. She also had a special bond to this place, so I had a good hunch that she would be here. However, I told him about the drag marks, the blood, and the paw print that I saw. I was just so worried about her safety. Detective Pavers listened to my story. He took down some notes in a notepad. Although I felt like he was just getting a very general idea of what was happening and not a very detailed account. He looked at me when I was done and asked, did her boyfriend meet up with her last night or today? I said, I'm not sure. I can only assume that they did from his weird behavior. I don't know what could have possibly happened between them. But I'm not sure how that matters now because it seems like she was attacked. Detective Paver said, well, perhaps she was down here for a reason, but not for one of her own. Detective Paver asked, do you think he would have done something to her? I thought about it for a second, and despite everything that had happened, I didn't think that Lewis would do it. Lewis was a law student, and although he was physically fit, he didn't particularly like hiking. I always thought of him as a nice guy, and he didn't seem like he would just blow up and do something so irrational. Also, I didn't think he had the expertise of creating a scene of a wild animal attack. I said, no, I don't think so. With everything that's happened, I still couldn't believe that this was happening in the first place. My mind was still trying to make sense of everything. Detective Paver started walking down the trail. I called out to him, should I just wait here? He turned around and nodded his head and he said, I'm going to investigate the area. I waited for him in my car. After a few minutes, I decided to use my phone to post several updates about the situation about Natalie. I wanted to make sure as many people knew about the last spot Natalie was in and who and how to contact them and who to contact if they wanted to help. It seemed to me that the most likely thing that was going to happen is that people needed to come and help search the area. Hopefully, they could find her as soon as possible. As I waited in my car, I was curious that only one police car had pulled into the parking lot. I assumed the other ones were going to follow soon after it. After several more minutes, I finished the last post. Then I saw Detective Paver coming out of the forest. I was a little shocked because it didn't seem like he had been there for a very long time. I didn't think he had enough time to secure or investigate the crime scene thoroughly. Because the amount of time he was gone, it just seemed like he walked there and came right back from the spot where I had seen the phone. I quickly got out of my car and asked, Did you find anything else? Did you find any more evidence? Detective Paver pulled out a plastic bag. Inside of it was Natalie's cell phone. He asked if I knew the code for it. 
which I did because she let me borrow her phone a lot and use it to make calls and purchases on it. I unlocked it for him and he immediately went into the camera album. As soon as he opened up the library for the camera, a blurry picture of something tan and brown popped up. I froze. I was confused at what I was looking at. But then Detective Paver began to scroll through the pictures going through the past ones. There were many blurry pictures of the forest, the dirt and ground along the trail and some brown and tan blurs along the way. The next picture showed a blurry shadow of what seemed to be the body of a mountain lion charging at the camera. Then there was a clear shot of metallic reflective eyes that shone straight at the camera. There was no denying that it was a mountain lion. Definitely one that had stalked her because she had been taking pictures up until that point of just empty stills of her surroundings, probably trying to scare it off with her flash. My heart sank at the realization that this could have been her last moment. As I stared at the picture with those shiny metallic eyes, all I could focus on was them, that it was the last thing that she clearly saw before. I couldn't even think about it. I wouldn't let myself think about it. I knew she had to be still alive. She was strong. She had taken years of ice skating lessons and she had worked out vigorously to keep in shape. I knew she wouldn't have gone down easily and that I had to deal with the fact that there was suspicious evidence at her apartment that I found all that morning. Some things just weren't adding up. I just didn't understand it yet. Detective Paver turned off the cell phone and put the evidence bag back into his pocket. I asked when the other officers in the fire trucks were gonna get there. I wanted to stay there too, to help in any way possible. I knew that she was out there and I just wanted her to be found as soon and as safely as possible. Detective Paver waved off my anxious look with a small smile, as if it was meant to comfort me. Detective Paver said, the other officers will be here soon. They're just slightly delayed. I was in the area, so I was able to reach the site first. Detective Paver put his hand on my shoulder and said, the best thing you could do for all of us is to go to Mrs. Morales' house and wait for Natalie. I'm sure that Mrs. Morales is going to want to hear about these things that you have found out and I will be there to inform her later. But perhaps it's best if she hears it from you, somebody that is close to Natalie. I'm sure she's worried sick at this point about what is happening. Please go sit with her and comfort her and wait to see if perhaps Natalie will show up or just to hear news from us. We will handle the rest of the search and rescue from here. Also, we want to know where you're at to see in case Lewis makes his way over there. I'll send over a car or go personally later today to help you guys feel safe and patrol the area. I asked, are you sure there's nothing that I can do? I really would like to stay. Detective Paver squeezed my shoulder and said, right now, you are most needed with Mrs. Morales. Please help us all out if you just go there. I said, okay, if that's what's for the best. I went into my car and drove off to Mrs. Morales' house. As I went into her driveway, I waved to her as she exited from our house. She waved back very slowly and watched my grim face as I parked. She asked me, what's wrong? What happened? As soon as I got out of my car, I said, there's evidence that she was attacked by a mountain lion. There's blood. I trailed off because I couldn't bear the thought of the possibility that she could be dead. Before I even finished, Mrs. Morales began to cry. She sobbed and wailed in my arms. I hugged her and patted her back as we both slowly made our way inside to the living room together. A few tears slid down my face as well, but I tried to hold it together for her and for the slight hope that Natalie was alive. Mrs. Morales sobbed for what felt like an eternity until she finally burned out all of her tears. Then we silently sat together on the couch staring at the pictures on the wall. There were pictures of Natalie along with her old family pictures with her dad. After a long silence, Mrs. Morales asked for some more details. I told her what I could, trying to leave out as much of the gory bits as I could, and about what Detective Paver had said, that he would come along hopefully sometime tonight to come talk to her. She said, I see. Hopefully he will come soon because I really want to know what he's doing out there. I said, I hope so too, especially since he didn't want me there. 
I have already sent out a bunch of messages online for family and friends and how they can contact the police to see how they can help. I saw a small look of surprise pass over her face. She said, that was very thoughtful of you. I'm sure they're going to be in contact with you soon to ask for help and also to just offer their thoughts. I said, I'm pretty sure they have. I've just been waiting to answer them because I just want to help and support you right now. Mrs. Morales said, thank you. I appreciate your kindness and your support for being here for me. Just at that moment, her phone began ringing. She picked it up and said, hello? Oh, Detective Paver. Yes, Celeste is with me. We're both here. Do you have any additional information? I see. This is the best number to call me back. Okay, bye-bye. I anxiously had been waiting for her to end the call to see if there had been any new information. Mrs. Morales looked over at me. She said, they haven't found anything new. They just saw that the trail ends off into the brush. There isn't anything much after that. They need to get some dogs in order to continue the trail hunt. I asked, have they found Lewis yet? She said, no, they haven't. Mrs. Morales suddenly asked, talking about dogs, do you mind going over and taking care of Smush and Butters? I'm sure Natalie would appreciate you taking care of them. I said, of course I will. Do you want me to bring them back here? She paused for a second and said, yes, that would be a nice distraction. I said, all right, I'll be back as soon as possible. I went back and headed to my car. I waved goodbye as I pulled out of the driveway. I saw in my rear view mirror that as soon as I started pulling away, she was frantically dialing on her phone, calling someone. I guess it was probably Detective Paver, but I don't know why she would be calling him back if she had just talked to him. Maybe she just remembered a question that she wanted to ask. I headed toward Natalie's apartment. It was odd to see everybody in rush hour traffic trying to get home and the sun was already dwindling. I hated the summer months where daylight was short and the nights were long. It was all too much, knowing that these people's lives were just going on normally. God, my parents probably didn't even know that Natalie was missing. It upset me so much that all this turmoil that I was experiencing was so insignificant to the community. I cried a little in frustration. As soon as I got to Natalie's apartment, I saw it was swarmed with police. It scared me a little bit. It unnerved me to think that they were looking for evidence against Lewis that he was really a suspect and they were obviously taking it seriously from the amount of people that were going in and out. I saw Smush and Butters tied out in the front of the stairs. As I approached the apartment building, they both wagged their tails and barked happily to see me. I saw Detective Paver again at the apartment building. He quickly handed off the dogs to me as he was on the phone. His face looked stressed and worried. Before I walked away from the apartment building, Detective Paver asked me if I had taken anything from the apartment. I was overwhelmed by everything that was going on and quickly just said no. That had just organized some of the mess. He stared at me hard for a second, then said, okay, go back to Mrs. Morales' house. There's already a patrol car there. I thought his intensity was a little odd, but I didn't question it. I drove back to Mrs. Morales' house. The patrol car waved me through and I pulled in all the way to the back. At this point, it was almost dark. I took the dogs around the little yard and I noticed the wet smell that came from one of the garbage cans. I wandered over to it and realized that the burn smell was burned paper. I wondered what it could have been. Mrs. Morales called out to me and invited me back inside. I put the dogs in the master bedroom where Mrs. Morales slept. There was an uncomfortable amount of silence as we both didn't really know what to say to each other. Eventually, we started talking about some of our memories of Natalie. But it felt strange to me because it seemed like we were reminiscing as if she was already gone. Then I changed the topic to about smush and butters. Then Mrs. Morales asked, Did you take anything from the apartment? I was caught off guard by the question. I said, Detective Paver asked me that before I left the apartment. I didn't take anything. Mrs. Morales said, I know there's been a lot going on, but it's really important if you remember if there was like any folders or papers. I said, the only thing that I remember is Lewis taking those folders and files with him from the apartment, but I don't remember taking anything. Why? What's wrong? Mrs. Morales said, 
It's because Detective Paver was asking. And also, Natalie told me about the genealogy report that she had printed out. She was really excited to show me. And that's what she wanted to do today. But, you know, what happened, happened. I'm sure Lewis must have taken it with him, obviously trying to take as much as he could and hurt me with it. I was caught off guard because Mrs. Morales shouldn't know about the genealogy report because it was supposed to be a surprise for her. I highly doubt if Natalie had come here to talk about Lewis's cheating and she would have had a nice side conversation about her freaking family tree. I thought it was really weird that Mrs. Morales would bring it up anyway. I also remembered that I had taken the few pages off the floor from the printer. I decided to play dumb. I said, oh, the genealogy report? I remember that she said that she wanted to talk to you about it and that she had told you. Did you find anything out? Mrs. Morales said, so you knew about the genealogy report? I said, yes, because she had told me that she had told you about it, but that there wasn't much and the results weren't going to come in until last night and that she was going to tell you everything afterwards. She had told me that it upgraded about midnight, so it's just really unfortunate that we won't know until she opens up her account. Mrs. Morales asked, Do you possibly know her account information? I think it'll be a nice distraction to see what sort of things she would have found out, what we could have seen together. I said, I just know her email like you do. I'm not sure what her password would be for that site. Did you try doing smush and butters and then her birthday after? I do know that she likes to keep her password simple. Mrs. Morales said, it's not it, it didn't work. I said, oh, well, I paused for a second, then said, I'm sorry, that's pretty much the only one I know that she uses now. Mrs. Morales said, she must have used a different password for that account, probably an older one, because this was very important to her, obviously. I thought for a second, thinking that this line of questioning was very odd. But in the moment, I couldn't really think of why she was asking. I said, sorry, I'm not sure. Mrs. Morales paused, searching my face, then said, that's all right, I'm sure he'll come to you. In that moment, we heard Butters coughing and slightly gagging. We both rushed into the room and saw that Butters was throwing up something that they had chewed up. It looked like it was a pillow that had been lying on the bed. Mrs. Morales yelled and ran off to get some more towels. I went ahead and yanked the rest of the pillow out of Butter's mouth. I ran into the bathroom to quickly get some water and to wet a towel. As I wet the towel, I noticed something that gave me a pause. A second toothbrush inside the holder. I knew that it couldn't be Natalie's. She used the guest bathroom in the guest room. I didn't know of any man that Mrs. Morales was dating. Quietly, I looked inside one of the cabinets right next to the sink. Then I saw it. There was a bottle of cologne sitting partially hidden by a tall stacks of perfume. There was also a tall bottle of what looked like peppermint flavored mouthwash, which I knew Mrs. Morales didn't use because she didn't like mint flavors. I heard Mrs. Morales come back into the room yelling at Butters. I quietly shut the door of the cabinet, then rushed out of the bathroom holding the wet towel. I helped clean up most of the vomit off the floor, then took Butters and Smush with me to the guest bedroom so I could watch them while Mrs. Morales sat in the living room watching the TV. My head was spinning. I was wondering what the hell that extra toothbrush was there for and who Mrs. Morales was seeing and if it had anything to do with Natalie. I thought about the papers that were still in my bag. I quietly snuck out the back to my car and pulled my bag out of the back seat. It was difficult to see as it was pitch black outside. I went back inside the house and quietly locked the door of the guest room behind me. I pulled out the papers from my bag. There was only a few pages. I skimmed through the first few. I recognized a few names that were some of Natalie's family members, but there were quite a few names I didn't recognize. I got to almost the last page when I recognized one that I shouldn't have. I saw Frederick Paver. I instantly remembered Detective Paver. I remembered that his first initial had started with an F. I saw under the name, it showed a familial link. 
a paternal familial link. My heart sank and I could feel the cold wash over me. Pieces started clicking together. The spare toothbrush, Detective Paver being the first on the scene, Mrs. Morales' weird questioning about the genealogy report. From what I put together, Mrs. Morales had cheated on her husband all those years ago, probably when he first got diagnosed with cancer. Mrs. Morales must have slept with Detective Paver, and Natalie was actually his child. They probably had been screwing around for years. I slid far back into the bed, just shocked by this revelation. I stared up at the ceiling, completely shaken about what deep family secret I had just found out. This must be why Natalie had been so upset. This is why she probably came here. She found out they had been sleeping together and she had obviously gone crazy, but I don't understand why Natalie was missing. I knew that she got attacked, but I don't know why she went to the forest of all places. Maybe she was going to tell everybody and ruin their reputation. Or maybe she had really just run off into the forest, devastated by the news, and then gotten attacked. But it all seemed too convenient. My head was spinning with the possibilities that could be happening. And I felt sick that Mrs. Morales could be hiding such information about Natalie. And the fact that she had been lying to our faces all these years about who she really was. That she was pretending to be this perfect wife and mom. My skin crawled with the fact that I was sitting in her house. That I comforted her when she knew way more about the situation than I did. And obviously knew more about what happened to Natalie. As I lay there on the bed, the dog's ears perked up. I heard a creaking coming from the back entrance. I realized I had forgotten to lock the door. This is the type of neighborhood you didn't feel like you needed to lock your doors until night. But I had been so focused on everything else that I forgot about Lewis. I had felt so safe by the fact that there was a patrol car going around the neighborhood. I didn't think he would be bold enough to come inside. He was the only one that would come in through the back because Mrs. Morales hadn't gone to greet them. I felt completely electrified my senses on high alert, trying to pinpoint his exact location. I heard the footsteps coming closer. I heard a clicking and I realized that he was switching the lights off as he was coming down the hall. I quickly folded up the papers and I stuffed them into the crack between the tall baseboard and the wall where me and Natalie had stuffed papers there before as a time capsule for the next owners. The dogs jumped off the bed. The clicking noise of their nails alerted whoever was in the hall. I slid under the bed as far as I could and held my breath. I steadied it as much as I could. The door handle jiggled and then I heard a clicking noise coming from the door lock that he was jiggling it open. I knew that the locks were old and that he probably was just using a paper clip. There was a click. The door slowly creaked open. I could hear my heart pounding so hard it hurt my chest and it was like I could barely breathe. I could barely hear his footsteps above the heartbeats. Dead leaves and twigs slowly fell off and landed on the floor as he walked. The feet came to a stop right next to the bed. The dogs jumped happily on the legs of who I knew it had to be Lewis. Suddenly he crouched down and the gun was in my face. Lewis said, I don't have time to play these games. Get out now. He said in a quiet but deadly voice. He said, don't scream or I will shoot you. I could hear the TV playing loudly from the living room as Mrs. Morales had no idea what was going on. I slowly slid myself out from under the bed. I came face to face with Lewis. His face was dirty. His clothes were full of leaves and torn. His eyes were red and bloodshot. I could smell the alcohol coming off of him. The gun, however, was trained steadily on me. I said, Lewis. Before I could say anything else, he put his fingers to his lips. We saw out in the hallway blue and red lights dance across it. The patrol car was slowly going past the house. The lights were reflecting down the hall. My mouth was dry, and I felt like I was overloaded with fear that I was becoming numb. As soon as the light passed, Lewis motioned for me to go outside into the hallway. He closed the door with the dog still inside the room. 
I was scared of what he was going to do, so I just followed his directions. As we made our way down to the living room, he flicked off the lights. Each footstep felt like agony, so heavy like I was walking towards doom. My breath caught in my dry throat and it made me feel like I was suffocating. We finally got to the living room. He flipped off the last light that was by the TV. Mrs. Morales jumped up as she saw him standing right behind me. Louis pushed me to go stand beside her. Mrs. Morales looked over at Louis and said calmly, What are you doing here? I stared at her very confused. Louis said, I'm here to get the truth. No more lies. I want to fix what I can from this situation. Mrs. Morales said, There's nothing for you to fix. We're trying to do that already. Why can't you follow along? I stared shocked at Mrs. Morales, wondering what the hell she was talking about. Louis said, Oh yeah, your grand plan is that Natalie disappeared because she was attacked by a mountain lion? He asked, Then why are they looking to arrest me for her murder? You don't think they're going to look into my background, what happened, and find out everything? Mrs. Morales said, because you know that you're a probable suspect, but the evidence supports the fact that you're innocent. Just like I told you, I would protect you. Louis laughed dryly and said, I don't even know why I asked, because honestly, I don't care. I just want to end it all. I panicked and said, Louis, I know you didn't do anything wrong. I saw the genealogy report. You had nothing to do with it. It was Detective Paver. I know they're forcing you to cover up their affair. That Natalie's their child. We could go to the police together. We could tell them that we have the evidence. Louis looked at me and he started to laugh. It was painful and hoarse from his drinking. He looked at me through tears. You have no idea. I'm guessing you took the rest of that report that had that one piece of evidence. Which Paver and Stephanie stupidly thought that they could get rid of the account without anyone noticing. He pointed towards Mrs. Morales. I was scared of his laughter and it turned even crueler and he smirked. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this shit? That report wasn't Natalie's. It was mine. One of the affairs with Stephanie was also mine. I looked at him, confused, my brain refusing to process the information. Mrs. Morales said, Don't! We can work this out! Louis said, Shut up! Shut up! Natalie is going to be so broken after all of this. He swayed unsteadily on his feet. He covered his face with his hand. He wiped the sweat off. Do you get it, Celeste? Do you know how much I have been screwed by fate? Finally, everything clicked into place. I put my hands over my mouth as the absolute disgust filled my soul. I looked over at Mrs. Morales. She said, Don't look at me like that. I didn't know. All I knew is that I loved him the moment I laid my eyes on him. I couldn't help but love him as he is now. As a man, Louis yelled, No more of this fake love. I can't live with myself. I can't even look at myself in the mirror. Mrs. Morales looked at him and said, I had nothing but real love for you because of our real blood connection. We had a natural deep bond. It's just the way it all turned out was a mistake. I couldn't believe I had been so wrong. The affair, the bloodlines, the secrets all collapsed at this moment. Louis had tears running down his face. His face was twisted in pain. The words pierced him like nails. He asked, Tell me one thing I need to know. What did you name me before you gave me up for adoption? Miss Morales said, it was Brian Estevan Paver. I gave you the name of love and our family, your father's last name and your grandfather's name from my side. I did the same thing for Natalie, but with the grandmother's names. He said, how can you say something like that to me? Do you know how disgusting I feel? 
I want to rip my skin off from the thought of you touching me, of what we did, what I did to Natalie. God, I wish I could erase that look off her face when she saw us in bed together. How do you not feel the same disgust? Mrs. Morales had tears streaming down her face. Her voice finally broke. She said we were so happy. It was worth it. Bang, bang, bang! The air cracked with the shots from the gun and blood sprayed from Mrs. Morales' body. I screamed and I felt the warm blood shower over me. She fell backwards. I curled up into a ball and tried to move as far away as I could. The blood seeped out from under her body. Louis looked over at the body with a blank expression, no longer pained. He pulled out a phone and tossed it to me. It lit up and showed that it had been on the entire time, on a call. It was to 911. He motioned and said, answer it. I put the phone up to my ear and said, hello? The operator asked, is Louis still there? I said, yes, he is. At that moment, lights of a dozen cop cars pulled up to the house, the red and blue spinning in a dizzying dance. Louis said, I told them everything. I want them to know everything that happened here. I could hear the operator asking if I was okay, but I could only focus on Louis's words. Louis said, please. Take care of Natalie. You were the only one who cared for her. I said, that's not true. Everything you've done helped her. They're going to find her. Louis laughed dryly. I know. I made sure of it. Whose dead hands did you think I got this gun from? Yep. Dear dad tried to have a drinking party with me to try to come around to their plan. But here we are. He said, really, if it wasn't for your call, Natalie would be dead. They thought that she hadn't told anyone about her surprise trip besides me or anything about the report. They thought they had enough to spin a better story. But then you called. They had to make something up that you would believe because you were the only one who would have pushed for answers. And her being missing, possibly dead, was their brilliant idea. You can't prove anything without a body, right? And a crooked cop to sweep it away? We heard the police shouting outside. Lewis looked outside with a peaceful expression on his face. He turned to me and said, Don't look. I closed my eyes and flinched at the sound of the gunshot. I kept my eyes closed as I heard the rush of the police enter the room. I felt myself being lifted into the air and carried outside. I kept my eyes tightly closed. I didn't want to look at the terrible scene. I felt myself laid out onto a stretcher and the paramedics checking me over. I just wanted the noise to stop. It was so loud and so many people yelling. I curled into a ball. But then I heard my name in the distance. My eyes snapped open and I jumped off the stretcher. I pushed everyone out of the way. I furiously looked around. Running towards the ambulance was Natalie. She was covered in bruises and cuts. Her eyes and nose were red from crying. She was alive. I ran over to her, so grateful to give her a big hug. She sobbed as she collapsed into my arms. I was exhausted and I fell onto the floor with her. As we cried together, my relief was overwhelming. Finally, I had found Natalie. Thank you everybody for listening to today's story. I really loved writing this story. I like true crime and I hope I did a good job of embracing the atmosphere and just the storytelling aspect of it. Please let me know down below if you're on YouTube what you thought about the story. Let me know how much you liked it and if you would like similar stories in the future. Also, please follow us on Instagram at a Midnight Tale Podcast. That way you can get updates and also you can see some other mini stories that we like to post on there. Wherever you're listening, please like, subscribe and share. I really love storytelling. I love the way that it excites people and it brings us together over our love of just an exciting story. 
I would really appreciate if you share with your friends and family about our new stories that are coming up. For December, there's going to be a slight shift in tone. We're going to have some more happy, sappy stories. Hopefully not too sappy. I'm glad that you're all here today. This is me, Celeste, signing off until again. I'll see you in your dreams. Bye, everybody.